Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Travel Talk Tuesday, August the 2nd, 2022. Wow, I'm still here at home in my kitchen in Florida, and uh, it is sweltering hot here. Uh, 100 degrees almost today, I think 97 I saw on my watch out here. Luckily, I've been upstairs in my office all day working on Travel Talk Tuesday, so I haven't been out there. Uh, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, uh, I'll be able to share with you some of the projects I've been working on right here at home in, in Littleburg, Florida, before we head on, on before I head on back to Europe. Uh, we've got uh, tonight and two more weeks of a uh, live Travel Talk Tuesday, and then I uh, fly back to Barcelona and begin a series of tours and uh, exploring Europe um for gosh probably six seven weeks or so and uh so i think uh i'm looking forward to that but i'm really happy to be home and to be able to uh, get some work done around the house here and to catch up on a lot of exploring europe stuff so thank you guys for joining me tonight <clears throat> we're uh, again talking about uh italy tonight and specifically tuscany and siena consequently i have my uh campari spritz that's uh, one-third uh, uh, Campari, which is a liqueur from up in the north of uh, Italy, uh, specifically from the region of Milano, and then uh, two-thirds of Prosecco, and then a little dash or so of sparkling water to go on top of that. I also have a little antipasti plate of uh, some uh, bruschetti. So toasted bread with uh, goat cheese, in this case, on it. Some artichokes, olives, and peppers that are roasted. And uh, later on for dinner, we're going to have as an antipasti uh, this plate, which looks really great, is some heirloom tomatoes and burrata uh, and uh, with olive oil and basil on it. So the heirloom tomatoes, we... Uh, Got right here in Florida. I tasted a couple of them. We got them at Fresh Market here, and they're pretty good. The burrata is, um, it's a mozzarella cheese with cream inside, and uh, that's a pretty good thing, too. And, of course, basil, salt and pepper, and olive oil from Tuscany. Later on, we're going to have uh, some uh, meatballs that I've got here on the stove, along with my, uh, my pasta sauce as well, and some spaghetti. So the meatballs in Italy are called polpette or one is polpetto, uh, and Italians typically do not eat meatballs with spaghetti. That's an American thing, but we're going to do it in American-like tonight. So we're going to have a spaghetti and meatballs all at the same time, and uh, so we're looking forward to that too. But before we go any further, I want to thank y'all, you guys for joining in, and let me tell you that we're finishing up what I could not complete last week, and that is a look around the inside of the Duomo in Siena, Italy. So let me share my screen here and let this run. There is, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, commentary I've already recorded today, but I will stop every now and then and, and let you hear. So this is the outside of the Duomo in Siena. It's built in the 1200s. Uh, you can see it's just got, it's just loaded with, uh, it's called Pisan, I'm sorry, uh, we're not in Pisa. It's called Siena Gothic style, a lot of frills, statues and everything. Uh, this cathedral took uh, several centuries to complete. This is the interior of it, and I think I begin, begin talking pretty soon uh, about the interior of this, but uh, you can see these particular type of marble columns just seem to soar up to the ceiling and uh, they're black and white marble but really the black is pretty much really dark dark green uh, you just can't tell it from this photograph but uh, if you get up close and inspect it it's dark green I'm going to use this little uh, zoom in thing on Google Earth here to show you again because I like doing that but you can see where Siena is it's right between Volterra and Florence Pisa is over here, so right in the very center of Tuscany. So that's where Siena is, and here we go with the Google map, uh, Google Earth map, going all the way, zooming in to the Duomo of Siena. That just amazes me, because I've had a drone up there, my own drone, and it looks exactly like that. 
So here we go, I think. The nave is the main spine of the church, usually running west to east in churches built during the Middle Ages. But boy, this nave is so impressive. Zebra-striped columns seemingly rise forever upward to the ceiling. And the blue and gold ceiling artwork pops out and illuminates the entire cathedral. All this draws the eyes to the altar in the distance and the mosaics on the floor. Now, take a look. Look up there, way up high, and you see rows of 172 heads peering down at the floor. These are supposed to depict the 172 popes who reigned from the time of St. Peter until the present, or at least until the 12th century when the church was built here. It's hard to see way up there, but with a close inspection, or even some binoculars, you might be able to uh -huh. see that the same four faces are repeated over and over and over again. I guess uh, back in the day, nobody knew what those early popes looked like, so just four of them way up high. No one would be able to tell the difference. I'll get to the mosaics on the floor in just a moment, but notice the lack of people or tourists here in the Duomo. This was taken last fall, October 2021. The crowds were noticeably different in uh, June of 2022 this year when we were there. I mean, about five or six times more here in the Duomo. Next week, I'm going to share with you uh, some of my uh, tour guide friends posts from uh, say Amsterdam and from Greece uh, about how crowded things are now in Europe. Uh, it is um, unbelievable looking at some of those photos about uh, I saw uh, a post today, 16,000 people are showing up on top of the Acropolis in Athens, Greece each day. We were there last uh, year, last July, uh, 2021. And uh, I have photos with me being up there with myself and just the people in my group. In one case, there was three of us up there and I think three of us were in the photo and that was it. But uh, things are getting back to normal or almost all back to normal and even more so in Europe. So no problems with traveling, just trying to find the right time to go and trying to uh, stay away from the huge tourist crowded areas. The dome here is impressive, especially for a 12th century structure. It is erected on a 12-sided base wall and back in the day, it was innovative and unusual. Remember, this dome was constructed almost a hundred years before Brunelleschi's dome up the road in Florence. Although the technology and construction techniques for the Greek and Roman era had not yet been rediscovered here in Siena, this 12-sided dome was the marvel of the age. The dome seems to soar up to the heavens, especially with the coffered ceiling panels but upon closer inspection, it's an illusion, a trick on the eye. The coffered panels are painted on the ceiling, not embedded in the structure. Notice too, that the panels become smaller the higher up the dome they progress, making the dome look larger than it really is. Now, let's talk about these mosaics here on the floor. Several times a year, usually in the spring and fall, the Duomo floors are uncovered to reveal wonderfully detailed mosaics. These floor mosaics began in the 13th century and are made of marble, all various colors chosen for the pictorial content. Some 40 different artists over a period of 200 years labored intently on these floor mosaics and they are all worth a look. Let's take a look at one particular one near the center entrance of the Duomo. This mosaic is located in the very center of the Duomo, right in front of the entrance door, the second mosaic in front of the entrance door. This depicts the she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus 
this is a classic symbol of Sienna. Notice that Sienna is at the center of the universe with rival Tuscan cities circling the outside. Look, there's uh, Pisa, identified as a rabbit in the eight o'clock position, and Florence up there at 11 o'clock is identified as a lion. You'll also see uh, Rome down there looking like a lumbering elephant. All these depictions are designed to make Siena most prominent because it's displayed right here in the Duomo, the House of God of Siena. Looking up to the east end of the church, you'll find the rose window, which is dedicated to the Virgin Mary. This is a copy of the original made in 1288. If you were able to zoom in, you could see Mary up there in a sphere with angels carrying her to heaven. This work is by a local artist named Duccio, who, like Frau Angelico, was a century ahead of his time in producing 3D realism. By the way, the original rose window from 1288 is located nearby in the Duomo Museum. The Piccolomini altar is located uh, about halfway down the nave on the left-hand side. It was built in the early 1480s and was intended to become the tomb of Cardinal Francesco Piccolomini. But he later was elected Pope Pius III and eventually buried in the Vatican Museum. This altar is three stories tall with many niches that stood vacant for years. By 1501, Michelangelo, a 25-year-old artist who was asked to sculpt 15 statues for the altar, he only got around to completing one statue, and that is of St. Paul. It's the one on the lower right. Check out St. Paul and how he compares to the other statues around him who were probably completed by um, Michelangelo's assistants. Now, there's some characteristic things on the statue of Paul that Michelangelo put in, themes that abound on many of his other works of art. For example, look at his eyes. They resemble the eyes of Moses, which is uh, in, uh, now in Rome in St. Peter's and Chain Basilica. And also, uh, there's a broken nose, as, which is a self-portrait Michelangelo always includes on many of his sculptures because Michelangelo's nose was broken early on in life. And then finally, there's the relaxed hand, which resembles that of uh, Michelangelo's David, which is in the Academia up in Florence. If you're standing under the dome and you're facing the rose window, the next side is right behind you, so do a 180. Find the two striped pillars with poles attached to them. These flagpoles were captured from the defeated Florentines at the Battle of Monteperti on September 4th, 1260. Can you believe it? These things are 762 years old. They were the flagpoles that once held the battle flags of the Florentines. The Sienese defeated the Florentines on that battle of September 4th, 1260. Those flagpoles hold a very hallowed place in the heart of every citizen of Siena. This pulpit is 100% Correra marble and is designed and constructed by Nicola Pisano. He, like Duccio, was way before his time using three-dimensional realism, meaning that the sculpted figures appear lifelike and pop out in three-dimensional forms. There are seven panels, each depicting a portion of the life of Christ. Most were done by Nicola, but a few were completed by his son Giovanni. Notice the crucifixion panel. Look how lifelike Jesus looks. And look at Mary down there swooning with some of the disciples holding her up. And finally, look at the last judgment panel. There Christ is, St. Peter with the keys of the kingdom. The... Uh, the ones going up to heaven are on Christ's right hand side, and the damned going to hell, looking like uh, some kind of uh, demons going down to hell on the left hand side of Christ. To the left of the pulpit in the apse is a wonderfully depicted mosaic of the biblical story, The Slaughter of the Innocents. Here, 
King Herod, wicked King Herod, is slaughtering all of the babies to prevent the coming of the Messiah. This mosaic was done in the late 1400s, so well into the Renaissance, and depicts this, uh, again, 3D um, realism and just uh, emotion popping out from the dead babies, the crying mothers, the soldiers, people in grief, everything else. But this artist has done a fantastic job per portraying the slaughter of the innocents. Let's take a look at the Chapel of the Madonna del Volto. This chapel was done by Bernini. He's been very famous in history for his statues, fountains, and sculptures down in Rome, but he was commissioned to design this chapel in the 1600s for the wealthy Chigi family. Bernini was a master of the Baroque artistic style. Ornamentations, frills, and vivid colors pop out in all directions. Notice uh, this uh, statue of Saint Jerome embracing the crucifix almost like a musical instrument. And then there's Mary Magdalene. She swoons in almost ecstasy, half clothed with flowing robes and ascending up to heaven. The painting here is the Madonna del Volta. Mary and Jesus are crowned with crowns made of gold and jewels. This is not Bernini. This painting is much older, dating from a Sienese artist from the 13th century. This painting is near and dear to the heart of every Sienese person. For generations, they have come to this chapel to pray and ask Mary for help. The Sienese believe it was Mary who helped them win that famous Battle of Monteparti, which brought fame and fortune to the city. The Madonna is the one also to whom the Palio is dedicated, the famous horse race that happens here twice a year. Now, the Madonna del Volto, Volto means an offering, and locals have been coming here to this chapel in front of this painting of the Madonna and child and providing offerings for centuries. Outside the chapel, you'll find some of these offerings. There are silver hearts, jewels, rings, necklaces, and other precious items. The Piccolomini Library is the last place we're going to look at here in the Duomo of Siena. It's across the nave from the chapel we were just visiting. The Piccolomini family is from Siena, and they were a group of businessmen and bankers from over several centuries. They all were very rich. Uh, the family produced many important people because of their wealth and fame. Two of them became popes. Many were businessmen, generals, and clergy. The library was built to honor one of their most famous family members, Aeneas Piccolomini. He grew up in Siena, and eventually he was elected Pope Pius II, the first humanist pope. These frescoes in the library depict Aeneas's life. The artist Pinriccio completed these frescoes around 1500. Each of these 10 scenes is framed in an arch and offers a peek into the life of the soon-to-be pope. Finally, I especially enjoy looking at these musical manuscripts. They're huge, probably about two feet by three feet, designed set so that many monks can gather around and sing the chants from these uh, illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated means basically that there are figures and artistic uh, embellishments on there as well. So you can see gold leaf and many designs uh, where maybe monks are singing or depicting uh, angels with uh, blowing wind and all of that. But the functional part of this is that the manuscripts were designed to be sung and to lift praises to the Lord inside the chapels and the cathedrals. Okay, well, <clears throat> unless you go to Siena and go into the Duomo, that might be a little bit too detailed, or too, too much history for you, but tug it into your mind, or if you've been there with me, 
uh, run through it again, and uh, hopefully you'll get a better understanding of what you will see or have seen. So uh, that kind of concludes my, uh, my Sienna portion of talking about Travel Talk Tuesday. Next week, I'll be back uh, for a look at Switzerland. Now, for almost 30 years now, I've been traveling to the Lauterbrunner Valley in Switzerland. And there are three mountain peaks called the Monk, the Eiger, and the Jungfrau that are poking up way high, 11 to 12,000 feet above sea level. And I've been there, like I said, for 30 years, and I've never been to what is called the top of Europe until my last trip in May. And I finally decided to uh, lay out the cash and the time to spend all day getting to the top of Europe and exploring up there. They guarantee that 365 years or 365 days a year, there is snow and ice. And I can uh, guarantee you that there is. There's a glacier that, uh, that goes down the southern slope of the mountain that has uh, been there for centuries. Plus, everywhere I was was covered with snow and ice. So I look forward to sharing you, sharing with you next week my uh, series about the Jungfrau Jolk and the top of Europe. So until then, thanks for watching tonight, and we'll catch you next week. Bye-bye.